Well, we made it. Happy Friday. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Alex Bell, and this is To The Point. We're taking time to tell more stories and an in-depth angle, and we're really diving deep into issues that are affecting all of our lives right here in California. And tonight's main point, when it comes to climate change, the choices people are making today can really shape our tomorrow. One California company is working with restaurants to turn unwanted leftovers into fuel. The Ferry Building in San Francisco is home to some of the best food. But as you enjoy the food, drinks, and views, you may not be thinking about what's going on in the kitchen. Cooking oil, essential in restaurants' kitchens and used to fry these delicious fries. But the oil does more than just fill our bellies with greasy goodness. It's also being used to help our environment in a farm to fuel tank kind of way. It's just another beautiful day at the Ferry Building, and as they get ready to open, so are the businesses. General Manager Jane Connor says that popular spots such as Hog Island are trying to be sustainable and practice what the Ferry Building preaches. The building is about celebrating local flavors. It has such a history in farming and farming traditions in those local flavors. And I think the stewardship of realizing in order to perpetuate just the, the abundance of the Bay Area, you have to take care of it. And that's where Crimson Renewable Energy comes in. They collect used cooking oil from places like the Ferry Building and turn it into biodiesel, says Tyson Kiever, Crimson Chief Operating Officer. Biodiesel is pour and go technology. You can take a gallon straight from this plant and put it right in a diesel vehicle and drive away. So how does Crimson Renewable take this and turn it into this? Each restaurant is bringing their gallons of used cooking oil to a one place in our building, in our loading dock area and they're putting the cooking oil there. So those six businesses every day are bringing in gallons and gallons. Yeah, it smells about as good as it looks. Drivers like Daryl collect oil in trucks like these, where it gets transported to their plant hours away in Bakersfield. We're here at our Bakersfield Crimson plant where we take that cooking oil from restaurants and convert it to biodiesel, which is pour and go in any diesel engine today. So we make biodiesel, which you can use in your diesel truck or in your home he heating oil furnace or in heavy trucks going up and down the freeway. Harry Simpson is the CEO of Crimson. Our mantra is collect, refine, refuel. So we're collecting used cooking oil up and down California. He started Crimson almost 15 years ago. To do something that I believed in, to try to do something specifically in renewable energy. And now we are the largest producer of biodiesel in the state of California. They work with clients like Chase Arena, home to the Golden State Warriors, Sierra Nevada Brewing, Buffalo Wild Wings, Outback Steakhouse, and Chipotle in Sacramento. And the carbon reduction for what we do here uh, is in the realm of 85 to 90 percent lower than petroleum diesel. Simply put, it's cleaner tailpipe emissions. Harry says Crimson's production of biodiesel is like planting 8.2 million trees or taking 108,000 cars off the road. The other good thing about biodiesel is that it burns cleaner. Specifically, it reduces particulate matter emissions compared to petroleum diesel. So the particulate matter emissions, especially PM25 and PM10, that's what gives people respiratory illness. So I think the volume of fuel that we produce as a company results in the reduction of, for instance, asthma in terms of thousands of cases a year. It's no surprise throughout the entire state of California that air quality is talked about very frequently, especially in places like right here in Kern County, where residents consistently see hazy days like what's right behind me. So really keeping emissions down improves air quality throughout the entire state. Harry says the market in California for clean burning low carbon fuels has really stepped up over the last decade. Crimson even expanded their Bakersfield location. This latest addition right over my shoulder here is some new technology that can take more distressed feedstocks, recycled cooking oil or real challenged oil from grease traps and other waste streams and repurpose it to biodiesel. Crimson has two locations, Bakersfield and Oregon. Between both plants, they have the capacity to pump out about 50 million gallons of biodiesel a year. This plant is a state-of-the-art plant, the most current generation. Uh, there's, it utilizes a technology that's only been built at two other plants in Europe. 
This is the first of its kind in the United States. Now they have a secret sauce when it comes to turning that cooking oil into biodiesel, so they wouldn't share the exact ingredients, but for those of us who aren't chemical engineers, Tyson says this is how they break it down into a usable product. So you can make biodiesel from all sorts of fats, oils, and greases. Think of any canola oil you have on the shelf in your kitchen. That's the base feedstock we're using to make biodiesel. In order for it to be reactor ready, I'll call it, we want to remove impurities because we're using recycled streams from restaurants. So we'll have French fries in it. It'll have chicken wing batter and other sorts. So we're going to filter it and we're going to dewater it and get lots of the impurities out. Then we have reactor ready oil and that's what, similar to what you have in your, in your kitchen right now on the shelf here, canola cooking oil. So we're going to take that, put it in the reactor and we're going to add methanol and a catalyst to it and some heat, some agitation, and it will separate. We're going to have fire diesel, which is a methyl ester. About nine parts will be methyl ester and one part will be glycerin. The biodiesel is then polished a little bit further and it's ready to go to market and be used in any diesel engine. By far the biggest use of their biodiesel goes to truck stops. Those big semi trucks you see going up and down the road, you would be hard pressed today in California to go to uh, a truck stop and find a, a fuel, a diesel fuel that does not have 20% biodiesel. Almost all the truck stops now are running or selling a fuel uh, that goes into the semi trucks that has 20% biodiesel. The biodiesel that leaves here typically gets blended with petroleum diesel and consumed at a 20% biodiesel, 80% petroleum diesel blend rate. California's economy also benefiting from this fuel. The economic impact is something Crimson is proud to keep local. The economic model for what we do is quite different than what people may be used to with like a major oil refinery where they're bringing crude oil from all over the world, uh, from the Middle East or Venezuela. Keeps dollars revolving in the local economy with jobs from people collecting the cooking oil, processing the cooking oil, bringing it to the biodiesel plant and then converting from here and selling it and using it here. Harry's dreams are to continue to grow the company and improve the environment the renewable way. It's investing in potentially a solar farm, other things to improve the sustainability of, of this facility. There's a recognition that we've got to start transitioning. And I don't think there's any one single thing that is uh, going to be the magic silver bullet. It's facilities like this bringing new clean burning renewable liquid fuels. There's electric vehicles. It's converting the grid to solar and wind. We need advances in battery storage technology to make that viable. And for places like the Ferry Building, Jane says the choices they make today shape their tomorrow. Just reinforces what we're doing here in terms of the sustainability and working with local businesses. It's going to be the shoppers of tomorrow. It's going to be the chefs of tomorrow. They're going to benefit from the decisions and practices we're doing today. And you can learn more about Crimson Renewable and the restaurants helping turn all of that cooking oil into fuel. Just head over to abc10.com slash links to the point. And also let us know if you have questions about turning leftovers into fuel. You can reach out to the team by emailing us at to the point at abc10.com. All right, Apple has issued an update for iPhones and you do not want to wait to download this one. We're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we'll show you just how easy it is to close those security gaps. Well, another day, another Apple update, it seems. But cybersecurity experts say that this software update is not something that you want to take your time with. Without it, hackers have the ability to take control of your device. Becca Habegger breaks it all down and shows you just how simple the fix is. The whole process of updating your phone to make sure you have the latest security should take less than 10 minutes. For the smoothest possible experience, you should make sure your phone is plugged into power and connected to Wi-Fi. When you open up your iPhone, you want to look for this settings icon. It might be in a different place on your screen. If you're having trouble finding it, you can always swipe right from your home screen and type settings into the search bar. Once the app pops up, tap it. It'll take you here. You'll want to scroll down until you see general. Tap that. On the next screen, tap Software Update. In a few seconds, you should see this latest available update appear. Tap Download and Install. You might have to enter your phone password. After that, you'll see that the download has started. This is where it takes a few minutes as the update is downloaded and then your phone installs it. Keep your phone on this screen until the process is done. You may be prompted to say, yes, install this now. Your phone will automatically restart. And once it's back up, you should see this notification that your phone has successfully updated. Then congratulations, you're protected until the next security 
update. As the tech website The Verge puts it, constant security updates aren't necessarily a bad thing. Sure, they could be an indication that a lot of bugs are slipping into software, but they could just as easily mean that a company has gotten really good at finding existing issues and stamping them out. So why not update your phone now? And while you wait, keep watching To The Point with Alex Bell. Ah, I like the way that Becca thinks. All right, you can find more on the security fix at abc10.com slash to the point. Earlier this week, President Biden signed the Inflation Reduction Act. It's a massive health care and climate and tax bill. The president is hoping it's a win that carries his party through the midterms that are in about 80 days. About delivering progress and prosperity to American families. It's about showing the American and the American people that democracy still works in America. A big talking point we touched on earlier this week, the nearly $740 billion law includes major investments in health care. It expands subsidies to help 13 million Americans pay for insurance and caps prescription drug prices for Medicare recipients at $2,000 a year. So starting next year, the bill ensures millions pay no more than $35 a month for insulin. And capping the price of insulin will be something new in California. California. According to the Los Angeles Times, almost half of the country imposes a cap of some kind already, but California does not. The American Diabetes Association says about 3.2 million people in California live with diagnosed diabetes. The disease costs an estimated $39.5 billion in California each year. And speaking of inflation, federal data shows that food prices have jumped 13 percent just the last year. And that's the biggest year over year increase since 1979. So we asked some of you at home to show us how your refrigerator has actually changed with all of these prices. So let's take a look at that. Rebecca from Modesto says that inflation has definitely made it difficult for a family of six to barely get anything for $250. That is her fridge right there. We got Shelly on Facebook. She sent us this picture. She said that her husband noticed that the fridge was a little empty and asked if she was going to go shopping, but food is just too expensive. She says that she is thankful to the Choctaw, Choctaw Nation for um, assisting them with $200 a month in food. And then we have Danielle. She says that she still buys the same old stuff and things have not gone up. I have gone up, but nothing drastic. And thankfully, there isn't anything that she's had to stop buying because it's too expensive. Now, you can send us your photos of your fridge right on our Facebook or make sure that you email our team at abc10.com slash to the point. All right, buckle up. It's uh, time to check in with John Bartell here. We're hitting the back roads once again. And this week, we're heading to the Death Valley region to do a little mining in the desert town of Boron. Mmm, Borax sweet. Mmm, Borax sweet. Borax, the cleaning agent that our parents and our grandparents grew up with. 20 Mule Team Borax is nature's sweetener for laundry. The old fashioned powdered soap cleans clothes, cleans hands, and cleans dishes. Clean cutting board with all the troublemakers washed off. Borax may be old fashioned, but it's definitely not outdated. In fact, borax is inside modern items we use every day. You don't really know this, in your, but in your daily lives, you interact with it uh, constantly. It's not only is it in fertilizers for your food, um, it is in glass uh, for your television, it is in your, your cell phone here, this glass. Borax is inside hundreds of products and used by people from all over the world, but there's really only two places in the world that make borax, the country of Turkey in the desert town of Bora in Kern County, California. Borax is a, it's like an element on the periodic table, boron, right? And it's combined with other elements to be borax, like you see it here in the pit. The pit that General Manager Rennie Dillinger is talking about is the U.S. Borax Mine, the largest mining operation in California. We supply about 30% of the world's demand from, from this location here. Without actually visiting the pit, it's pretty hard to fathom how big it is and how much borax is being removed. That's deep, really deep. Lucky for you and me, the U.S. Borax has a fantastic visitor center, which gives you an up-close look at the mining process and the equipment. It's about 25 feet tall, uh, 20, 22 feet wide, and hauls, like I said, 270,000 tons every time that we take it to the surface. Borax is normally sold in powder form, but to get that powder, massive dump trucks must move borax boulders from the mine to the processing plant so they can be crushed and purified. Rennie says it's not uncommon for these monster trucks to be running 24 hours a day and burning about a thousand gallons of fuel each shift. 
how much to replace one of these tires? It depends. It, it kind of changes on you in time, but twenty to sixty thousand dollars. Before the massive dump trucks and heavy equipment, borax mining was a primitive process that involved mules and wagons. If you listen real closely, you can hear them over in this area hee hawing. Hee haw. After learning about the modern mining process at U.S. Borax, historian Jerry Gallegos welcomes people to the 20 Mule Team Museum in Borum to learn about the old school way. It all started in Death Valley where uh, they actually discovered eulocyte borax. In the early 1880s, borax was mined in Death Valley with a team of 20 mules. A mule is a, is a donkey and a horse? Cross. A cross. Mules are faster, stronger, and require less drinking water. When fully loaded, the 20 mule team could pull two wagons and a water tank, which weighed 36 and a half tons. This sounds like a horrible trip. It's very hot. Yes. Oh, yeah. It could get 130 degrees right now in summertime in Death Valley, if not hotter. The 20 mule team hauled borax 165 miles through Death Valley. Their strength and tenacity was highly revered, and their image ultimately became the logo on every box of the 20 mule team borax soap. Boratine, borax bleach, the, the borax hand cleaner, so everybody, that's what we've always been known for. From fire retardant to ceramics, innovators are constantly finding new applications for borax. But recently, a new element was discovered in the mine. So we have um, executed ways to extract lithium from waste material. So all of our waste material uh, has just a small amount of lithium. New refining processes are currently in the works to pull out lithium deposits. And someday soon, lithium could be used inside electric car batteries, only adding to the usefulness of this mine. One of the perks of coming to the Borax Museum is uh, you get to go home with your own Borax ore. From the U.S. Borax Mine in Boron, California, I'm John Bartell. Hope to see you on the back road. All right, we'll leave you with some good news on this Friday night. New technology is giving people who are deaf or hard of hearing the opportunity to have verbal conversations. These are augmented reality glasses from X-ray Glass based in England. The smart glasses pair with an app to turn speech into heads on display with subtitles in real time. This is a new way of being able to <laughs> communicate and be included in I this. Guess I yeah, she's like, she, she's naturally looking at me, but she's realising she doesn't have to look through me, she can just look through the glasses. You are the first deaf BSL in the world to experience oh. this. Yes. She feels very honoured. <laughs> I have goosebumps. I mean, that is just, that's amazing. These glasses are only available in the UK and Japan for now, but keep an eye out because they say that they hope to expand very soon, and I really hope that they do. Thank you so much for spending your Friday evening with us. We want to make sure that we know what's going on with you in your world, so make sure that you hit us up on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, or you can email me at to the point at abc10.com. I also want to shout out Heather Flores for sending us a really nice comment during the show. We appreciate you making us smile on a Friday. We'll see you back here on Monday.